Hola. Lo siento, no hablo español. Um, but thank you for listening to me in English, and thank you to Beatrice for translating today. Um, it's such an honor to be here with you all here in Caracas. Uh, I want to thank everyone who has made my visit and this project possible. Uh, the women of Backroom Caracas, Gujura Chacao, the city of Caracas, the American Embassy, the architecture firm ADJKM, and all the other partners and contributors who helped to make the forum, La Nave, and this lecture possible. Thank you, everyone. I know I was asked to speak today about sustainability, but instead I really want to talk about doing the impossible. Why is that? Because I believe that it's only when we aim for the impossible that we might expand the space of what's possible for ourselves and others. And I think that is the root of sustainability for me, expanding our idea of what's possible and finding ways to give that life every single day. But first, I want to tell you a little bit about myself. 15 years ago, I was working for a designer named Bruce Mao, who was famous for co-authoring a book with architect Rem Koolhaas called Small, Medium, Large, Extra Large. One night when we were working late, he told me a story about meeting John Cage, the conceptual composer and artist from the 1960s, just before Cage died. The meeting was in Cage's loft in downtown Manhattan on a busy street in Soho. Cage brought Bruce over to the window and pointed down at the bustling sidewalk below. That will be your problem, he said. The friction of all those people rubbing together. A few years later, I happened upon a lecture on the Ubuntu philosophy during a residency in the Netherlands. Ubuntu comes from a Nguni Bantu term that when translated means human kindness or humanity towards others. This philosophy believes that society gives individuals their humanity and that a person is a person through other people. Their greeting, Sana Bonani, means or translates, I am because you are. These two experiences have stayed with me and have greatly informed the work that I make, which started about 10 years ago with a karaoke ice cream truck. The truck was commissioned by Zero One, the San Jose Biennial for Art and Technology, to be a mobile interface. It was a collaboration with a game designer, Katie Salen, and a filmmaker and artist, Marina Zirko, and was inspired by all the broken ice cream trucks that haunt the nighttime streets of Brooklyn. For years, we've thought about those trucks and how they always want a better song. When we learned that San Jose is a trilingual city, English, Spanish, Vietnamese, we looked for a common thread amongst all those cultures we found ice cream and songs. So the idea is rooted in exchange economies so that the truck gives you an ice cream, but you give the truck a song. So you can see the ice cream truck arrives. It's driven by a squirrel. The squirrel starts giving out free ice cream free. And then when the truck is tired of giving away things for free, she stops and says, it's time for a song. Squirrels can't talk, so he has to point people out and pull them into the truck. She just came in off the sidewalk. 
I'd never made a public art project before this one, and I had no idea what was going to happen. And as you could see, it was a little bit magical. Everyone forgot their troubles and gave themselves over to the joy of performing or watching performances. It was then that I real <laughs> realized I had a really deep love for connecting with strangers in public spaces. And in the weeks following that project, I realized that we'd created something that game designers called a magic circle. A magic circle refers to the space created by the rules and the props and the mechanics of a game. When players step into the circle, they accept the rules of the game and leave the rules of everyday life behind. Magic circles allow us to play new roles enter into new challenges, see ourselves others and others differently, to be together differently, and provide for us a way to connect in unexpected and meaningful ways. And it's these experiences that go on to stay with us and inform our daily lives. So after karaoke ice, I just wanted to make more magic circles. I'm really interested in the way simple references to popular culture can create a magic circle. A particular favorite subgenre of movies of mine are heist films that feature laser maze security systems. This piece, Slow Mo Sequence, 2011, recreates the famous laser maze in the movie Entrapment with Catherine Zeta Jones. The installation simulates lasers with string, and it simply has a printout at the front door that says, warning, lasers are in use. Without any further instruction, everyone who entered became an action film hero. The Biennial Art and Technology in San Jose once again called and commissioned a piece about the future of the workplace. I thought about my own past experiences working in office and how dead they made me feel. At the time, I was also thinking about landscapes of persistence hunting and how to blend that with the office to make a different kind of working experience. So first, I built an office. I hired temporary office workers. And then we buried it. Over the course of the three weeks of the biennial, we had to remake our ideas of working in this workplace, which required knee guards, daily stretches, and we had to water our office every morning. The piece is called Creatures of Habitat. A couple of years ago, a friend and I were talking about, about how Ikea was a nicer place to hang out than our apartments and how we couldn't afford studio space in Brooklyn. So we decided to go to the IKEA in Brooklyn to draw. And the IKEA Art Club was born. Instead of buying furniture or eating Swedish meatballs, we make art and we leave it behind in the showroom. Unpacking art supplies in one of the model apartments turns the store space into another kind of magic circle. I invite shoppers and artists uh, in Brooklyn to join me several times a year to come together and to produce art instead of consume things. Shown here on the left, Finn Lappin, 
six years old, draws his dream house seated in one of the model kitchens. On the right, artists Robert Rancic and Marina Zerko have created an installation in a model bedroom called White Mountain. So much of my work happens in public space because I deeply believe in the project of public space, a place where citizens of a community can come together, have space to gather, share, dance, or debate, to be with one another, for one another, and find a shared sense of belonging. I was invited to create a performance piece for a new plaza in Queens, New York. It was located in Jackson Heights, which is one of the most culturally diverse neighborhoods in the world. It's home to over 45 languages and different cultures, but it wasn't my neighborhood, so I felt like the foreigner there. Spent a lot of time watching what happens in this neighborhood to understand the neighborhood better. I also did some other research and found that it was originally designed in the 1930s to be a garden community, a place with more trees and more grass than Manhattan for middle-class families to raise their children. Only in 2013, I couldn't find the grass or trees. So I decided to do what I saw so many other people doing in the plaza, carrying things. And I decided that I would bring the garden back to Queens. My idea was that by performing a recognizable activity, carrying things, but at a very absurd scale, uh, that would make a bridge between myself and those who lived there. It would give us a reason to connect, and it did. All day long, people asked me if I needed help, and we talked as we moved plants together. The, police, the piece is called Getting There, and we'll watch just a few minutes of that. You've done this, right? Oh, thank you so much. That's fantastic. Thank you. Go ahead. I can't find my Metro card. Quite heavy. Oh. Just down to the F. It weighed about sixty pounds. big one. Oh, I'm sorry, I don't have a free hand. You want to just tuck it, tuck it right in there? Tuck it right in there. Thank you. All right, I think that's enough. You guys get the idea. I had a pretty impossible idea. Um, and that idea actually came from a couple of other projects that I want to show you. Other projects that I think are impossible ideas because of their unexpected use of public space, the unexpected kinds of interactions they create, and the creative scale of time or space in which they operate. 
many of these artworks start by identifying a surplus resource with which to make the work, or a simple framework that simply kind of recontextualizes what already exists. This is a project from 1982. It steals my heart every time I look at it. It's by artist Agnes Dennis. She took a surplus, a surplus of land in New York City, and created an unimaginable image in downtown Manhattan. She planted a two-acre field of wheat in a vacant lot and grew it and harvested it. The piece is titled Wheat Field, A Confrontation. The artwork yielded a thousand pounds of wheat in the middle of New York City. And for the artist, it was a comment on human values and misplaced priorities. Very different kind of public art project as by my friend Jason Polin. He identified another type of surplus space in New York City open to the public, fast food restaurant tables. He knew that at Taco Bell in New York City, if he bought a drink, he could sit there for hours and do whatever he wanted. He turned that observation into the Taco Bell Drawing Club, which invites anyone interested to come and draw on Wednesday nights. The Drawing Club has been meeting for over 10 years and has inspired dozens of other drawing clubs around the United States maybe soon in Venezuela. I'm sure most of you are familiar with the idea of the key to the city. It's where foreign dignitaries and celebrities are given symbolic keys to the city as a gesture of welcome. Here on the left, US President Bill Clinton was showing the key to the city who was given to, them, given to him by the mayor of Buenos Aires at the time. There's a project in New York City called Key to the City by Paul Ramirez Jonas, which is probably my favorite public art project ever. His project inverted the power connotations of that symbol. Anyone could have a key to the city. Anyone could give anyone else a key to the city. And it turned everyone into a, into a celebrity in the city's eyes and turned dozens of locations around all five boroughs into places that should merit a celebrity's visit. Paul Ramirez Jonas created a system that simply coordinated dozens of locations and organizations and reframed them as heroic and important. They all followed the simple request to install a lock that matched the key to unlock something meaningful at the location. From a light switch and a lamppost to a locker in a boxing gym, to a gazebo on Staten Island. It's a project that literally unlocked the city for all of its people in a stunning new way, myself included. And the last one I'll show you is a project that started in 2008 in San Francisco. An architecture firm by the name of Rebar identified a ubiquitous type of public space and shifted its use with a very clever name called Parking Day. They took a parking space and changed it from a noun to a verb, from a place to, from a place to park to a place to make a park. They created an open system, a framework for public intervention and, and have invited people from all over the world to participate. You simply have to put money in the meter for the day and occupy the space with a park. So my impossible idea, easy. A pedestrian bridge built by hand. The project is called Citizen Bridge, and it started because of an island floating just outside my bedroom window in Brooklyn. When I moved to the waterfront, not only did I realize that I was surrounded by water for the first time, but that I was also living on an archipelago of islands. So the island outside my window is called Governor's Island. That body of water in between Governor's Island and Brooklyn is called Buttermilk Channel. When I started researching the history of the island, I learned that it was only 1,200 feet from the coast of Brooklyn. 
And at one time, the two land masses were joined by a sandbar at low tide. Walt Whitman wrote about Buttermilk Channel in, in an edition of the Brooklyn Eagle, a newspaper, in 1900, that the channel got its name because farmers used to walk their cows across the sandbar at low tide to graze on the island. If they timed their trip poorly, the cows would have to swim back through currents so rapid it would curdle their milk. The image was so powerful to me. It spoke of a time when the water was a public space for everyone to use, like streets or sidewalks or plazas. So I decided I wanted to reclaim the waterways as public space by building a bridge that would allow New Yorkers that free passage across Buttermilk Channel. I pursued the idea because although it seemed crazy, impossible, a single woman building a bridge, it also seemed completely possible to me. And over the course of the project, which is now in its fourth year, the meaning has shifted from just reclaiming public access to the water to helping New Yorkers reconnect themselves to the water. You see, in New York, we live in a sinking city. Water is an inevitable part of our future. We've had floods, we've had massive storms, and there will be more. So right now, we're scared of it. We don't know what to do with it, and we don't have a good relationship to it. The mission of Citizen Bridge is to bring that connection back through the experience of the bridge, walking on water. Uh, and a series of related programs that will actually teach New Yorkers how to swim, how to fish, build boats, grow oysters, and prepare for floods. This is a rendering of the current design of the project. And this is the first fully engineered prototype of that design, floating in the harbor with me on it, crying my eyes out just a month ago. It's one of 40 sections that will have to be built to make the crossing. So as you see, slowly, the impossible is becoming possible. All of these projects, in some way or another, have changed the way I think about public space. And in every case, those shifts in perception have opened up space for conversation and interaction with others. Because when we see these projects, when we experience them, we see ourselves a little bit differently too. These projects alter our social schema, what we think we can do as a community. And for me, that's the reason to aim for the impossible. And here's the secret I've learned. Nothing's impossible. But it requires maybe a few tools. Small, repeated gestures have really big results, right? Over the years, the Taco Bell Drawing Club has been meeting and has gotten so many members and has gained the interest of so many people around the country. They have now published books. There are Taco Bell Drawing Club books in the world. Citizen Bridge started with a very small, single model. Can you see it up there? It's no bigger than this podium. But now I've built seven generations of prototypes. And with every prototype, I've gained more knowledge and more support. I now have a team of seven engineers, two architects, five lawyers, and multiple other advisors helping to make the project a reality. Mm -hmm. Public art needs lawyers. Um, so yeah, so mobility allows for wider distribution, right? Because parking spaces are a feature in most cities around the world. Parking day can happen everywhere. These are photos from, sing from single-day parks all over the world. It happens every September, um, and the website it just invites everyone to participate. What's so interesting to me, though, is that Parking Day has also changed the way cities think about their resources, and it's created an entirely new form of urban planning called the Pocket Park, right? Where tiny, tiny pieces of land are getting turned into small public spaces. When permanence is ignored, the need to be permanent, the ephemeral creates a liminal space between fantasy and reality. Uh, did that really happen? That leaves traces behind. Working temporarily allows for multiple realities to overlay on top of one another. 
Wheatfield was born out of an empty construction site in Lower Manhattan. Once the wheat was harvested, it returned to a fallow lot for a while. And eventually, years later, a park was built on the site. Using what's available makes ideas happen faster, better, and creates more value with less. Key to the city actually made nothing new, except thousands of keys. The project simply reframed the spaces and places all over the five boroughs of the city by putting a special lock on them to be opened by those, those keys. And in that magic circle, New Yorkers traveled to places they'd never been before as ambassadors and emissaries. But impossibility can only become reality when people come together. The impossible is simply not possible alone. I've learned that nowhere more than working on Citizen Bridge. This is the list of people to date who have contributed to the project. Their expertise, their advice, or their time. Every time I talk about Citizen Bridge, I show this, my list of collaborators because it's not me making the bridge, it's all of us. And over the past six months, I've had the pleasure of working with Backroom, the architects of ADJKM, Kuchura, Chikao, the rest of the forum team on a new impossible idea here for Caracas to reframe the public space as a place of social exploration and empowerment. We've been taking these ideas, mobility, temporality, cooperation to create a magic circle here in Caracas. The project is called SHIP, or La Nave, and is based in sports, discovery vehicles, and shifting perspectives. This is some of the projects, and we, projects we've looked at and some of the sketches we've made. The idea started when in trying to understand Caracas and understand the circumstances of the public spaces, um, I learned that participation in group sports had really decreased due to the crisis. I was so saddened to read that because sports have always been my way out of emotional stress. They've also been a place of true community for me beyond social or economic barriers. I also really treasure sports because they offer everyone the possibility to take part in the game, whether that be a player, a referee, or a spectator. So we're using baseball, a sport shared both by Venezuela and America, as a form of social exploration, traveling through the city streets and public spaces and remaking them as temporary baseball stadiums, inviting everyone to play. We intend SHIP to be an instrument of a counter, conversation, and speculation we hope that it will inspire imagination and shift perspective the so future social possibilities in public space through our collective, collective acts of play. What will it look like, you wonder? What will it be like? You'll have to come out and see on Saturday. But I can show you what the process of its creation looks like. I don't think any of us really knew Monday morning what was going to happen but what a magic circle it was. From the first olas until yesterday afternoon, the group of over 40 architecture students from local universities, the architects of ADJKM, the staff of the back room, the incredible owners of the factory complex where we are building have become a family and the factory its home. We've entered into the roles of designers and builders and experienced planners but we've also entered into roles as baseball experts, explorers, and inventors. The group has worked together in teams for nine hours a day, making sketches, models, play testing ideas about baseball, debating, welding, and sanding. In fact, none of the participating students are here today because they're all still working on the project. The best part for me is that everyone owns this project. Everyone is the artist. And everyone has a place in this project because we're open to each other. We trust each other and believe that because we're working as a group, we're capable of achieving something great. And truly, we are doing the impossible. Projects like these normally take months of concepting, months of design, 
months of construction. But because of this great team and its spirit, it's the support and the generosity for the project, we are making a monumental project in just a few days. This week has reinforced the, these tools that I share with you today, and it's driven home all of the reasons why I make public and participatory art. Impossible ideas can expand the space of possibility. Asking big question, proposing ideas beyond one normal scale of thinking can change the scale of thinking for everyone. One of the first things I hear when I talk about Citizen Bridge is, I never thought that was possible. So just by asking the question, the project has changed the way that person looks at and thinks about the city and their potential power to change it. We've done the impossible so far this week just by working mainly with what's been donated to the project, what's been made available at the site of our construction. We haven't purchased very much to produce the project and are doing more with less. We've worked by, so many, by making so many small gestures, quick sketches, models, and games. We take confidence and joy in our experimental ideas because we are making an ephemeral experience without the requirements of having to be perfect and lasting forever. These constraints have given the project its magic and power and will shape the experience to, on Saturday in some exciting and unexpected ways. Everything around us, skyscrapers, roads, electrical systems, plumbing, is an act of imagination. But we tend to forget that. So it's moments like these with the ship that we can remember. And lastly, this is something I've been thinking about for a long time. Although my circumstances in New York are very different than those here, I struggle with the economical, economic, political, environmental precarity of the future. I spent a long time trying to find a way to cope with that precarity. And I've realized that although I may not have the power to change government or global policies and systems, that I feel more empowered when I find ways to connect with my fellow citizens and make very small actions that affect the tides and flows of our days. It's moments like this week, making the ship as part of such an incredible community that I am reassured that I am not rudderless and adrift because we are the ship and the sea. Gracias. <laughs>